Hello, I'm Thomas Hare, Chief Content Officer of the Performance Driven Marketing Institute, a not-for-profit trade association that serves companies in the performance and direct-to-consumer marketing world. Happy New Year, and welcome to the second event in our winter seminar series created by the PDMI's Workshop Council, Fearless Predictions for 2022. We welcome all of you to today's event, PDMI members and non-members alike. If you're not a PDMI member but are attending, we'd love to have you consider joining our association. There's no better way to support the mission of the PDMI than joining and sharing your voice in the direction of the industry. In the handouts tab of your control panel, you'll find our PDMI membership brochure. I urge you to download it, flip through it, and contact any of our team members should you desire more information. One more housekeeping note, the group will be addressing any questions from the audience at the end of today's session. If you don't have to wait to ask them, utilize the questions tab on your control panel to type and send your question in. We'll be collecting them and we'll try to get to as many as possible in the final moments of the webinar. Today, the Workshop Council welcomes this group of leaders from across all five of our PDMI member councils. We spent much, much time the past two years avoiding looking ahead too very far, but now is the time to think and act for the future. You're here today to hear from, them, hear from and consider thoughts from this group of performance and direct consumer marketing business leaders on what they expect in 2022. And without further ado, let's meet the group, which is one bigger than a Brady Bunch screen. <laughs> Um, or actually, it's too bigger than a Brady on screen, perhaps. Uh, Robin Bayard, co-founder and CEO of Inclover Marketing and also a member of the PDMI eCommerce Council. Chris Foster, Vice President of New Business at Modern Postcard and Chair of the PDMI Brand Response Council. Christine Georgiakakis, Vice President, Direct Brand Marketing and Performance Advertising for Reels Channel, a member of the PDMI Workshop Council. Mike Johnson, Vice President of, New, of Business Development for Pamerang, a member of the PDMI Workshop Council. Daniel Kaufman, a partner at Baker Hostetler, representing the PDMI Government, Government Affairs Council. Fern Lee, CEO of Thor Associates, a member of the PDMI E-Commerce Council. Marcelino Miares, the Managing Director of D2H Partners and Chair of the PDMI U.S. Hispanic Council. Andrea Pass, owner of Andrea Pass Public Relations and Chair of the PDMI Workshop Council. Kyle Patton, Vice President of Direct Response of Univision Communications and a member of the PDMI U.S. Hispanic Council. And last but certainly not least, Patrick Raymond, CEO and President of Really Cool Ideas and a member of the PDMI Workshop Council. We welcome all of you and thank you all for your service to the PDMI. So let's get started. Each member of the panel has brought two predictions to the table today and been instructed to keep their thoughts to three minutes or less. We're gonna go through the group in alphabetical order while also allowing for comments from fellow panelists on each leader's predictions. So Robin, no pressure. We're gonna start with you. <laughs> oh my, Welcome. always first, first in the alphabet. Um, so thank you and thanks for including me. I'm excited to be here um, with a lot of great thought leaders here. So I, I sort of honed in on, you know, on two, but the first one is in regards to the beauty industry. Um, I'm a you know, beauty consumer, crazy about all beauty products. I've worked on a lot of beauty brands, both in the U.S. and international. And my prediction is that authenticity is in and fake is out going into 2022. Um, CVS just did a study, and, you know, this is just for a highlight on that, that, you know, after two years of being like here, looking at ourselves, looking at others, it's had such an amazing, crazy, like, just paradigm shifting Im impact about our the way we see ourselves the way we see others and in the poll that CVS did I think it was one in three women feel less attractive now than they did a year ago and this is just women across the board so I think uh, there's going to be a lot of leaders like CVS with their beauty mark initiative which is really educating women about authentic and digitally altered photos I think things like QVC and they're doing in their originals, talking to people over 40 about beauty, where they're coming on camera without makeup, they're revealing their age, and you have companies like Womenness is another one that I've been watching that is changing the conversation around women heading or entering into menopause. So I think there's going to be an amazing shift. I'm personally excited about it since I have a 16-year-old daughter that's addicted to TikTok and beauty. So that's my my first one. And I don't know if, you know, that, Thomas, if there's conversation around that or. Well, let's go I on to the second one and then we'll we'll bounce back around to and see if anyone's got thoughts. Yeah. And my second one kind of ties into it. 
Um, but it's that re a recurring revenue model subscription is kind of rule the world if it's not already ruling the world. Personally, I think a lot of people in this industry have written the playbook, a lot of the brands on the original sort of continuity subscription, all our consumable types of business. But I think the playbook is going to change. And I think if you look across, you know, just your own life, Adobe, Netflix, Six Flags, you know, membership, Spotify, Xbox, even restoration hardware, which is a great case example of their new membership card, just really digging in and listening to customers and creating value added and, and just it's enormous growth. And the companies that are really doing this well, I think are going to win. And in terms of how the market's going to value them, I think they're going to have enormous uh, valuations and a lot of growth. So that's my prediction. Tremendous, Robin. Uh, thoughts from the panel? Anyone out there want to add or, or comment? Um, I'd like to comment on, the, on that first prediction. I think she's absolutely spot on. Um, in the class that I teach, I use the Dove um, Real Beauty uh, program as a, a wonderful example of culture and authenticity. They've been at it now for well over a decade, and the permutations have been massive uh, throughout all of their marketing programs, and it's influenced other brands. And as the father of two young daughters, uh, 20 and 22, who have grown up in front of a camera and grown up in front of taking selfies and 400 bursts and only two are ones that they actually think are reasonable to share with family. <laughs> I can tell you that the um, that's a real thing in terms of the, the TikTok generation and looking good on camera and how that affects their self-esteem. So well done, great insight, it's brilliant. Thanks, Chris. Kudos. Uh, Mike. <laughs> uh, uh, along the same lines uh, with Robin's prediction, that first one, uh, definitely the beauty space, uh, organic, uh, real content, it's king right now. Um, everything we do at Luminous, it's definitely going down that path. <laughs> you know, people want to see no makeup on, they want to see what it all really does they want to see the flaws they want to see what it's going to do for them it's just going to keep getting more and more that way i think all right Fern, do you well, have a last word in on, on that as well from the public relations standpoint in natural beauty and authenticity we're seeing more and more traditional journalists and homegrown journalists looking for ways to look natural looking for ways that aren't made up or aren't um, kind of fake looks. So we're seeing more and more journalists covering that and covering women as they enter and exit the menopause period. So women are beautiful regardless of their age and their, their time of life. And we're seeing more of that in the press. Right. Fern, uh, last word on this one. One thing to add there too, I'm also <laughs> liking that models are actually speaking out about this. Uh, I know Paulina has a big initiative um, just speaking about getting older and being natural and, uh, you know, not utilizing much of uh, the fakeness that is out there. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I agree. There's going to be a lot more of that. So. Great, great, great. Perfect. Um, Fern, you want to add or do you want to just move on? I'm good. I'm just the consumer wants everyone to be real. That's the that's uh, the that's the real that's the, the real deal. That's great. I wanted to, I wanted to go to you because it seemed like you were jumping and jumping and uh, but yeah, let's go on. Chris Foster from Modern Postcard, you are up next on the hit parade. Okay, no, okay. I started my stopwatch so I can close it up at three minutes. Um, <laughs> my first prediction is that niche businesses uh, will continue to emerge and grow. Um, you don't have to be a big brand to be a great brand. Um, and I think that the ones that lean into a cause or social good and engage their audiences are going to continue to thrive. Um, I also think that look for more of these businesses to emerge as B Corp. And I think that B Corps are going to be a bigger part of the conversation. And the lines between what might be a nonprofit and what might be a quote unquote social good company might begin to blur. Blackbaud recently, for example, um, did a purchase and an acquisition of a CRM system so they could lean into not just the nonprofits where they dominate the market space, but also with social good companies as well. So I think it's going to be part and parcel of some of these new businesses that are going to come out. 
And I think coupled with that is the trend and the, the importance to the next generation. And that's why I think these two fearless predictions kind of walk side by side together. So my second fearless prediction is Generation Z will finally start to pry open their digital wallets. Um, they're going to be the largest consumer group in three to five years. And so I think we're going to see some of these buying trends begin to emerge um, before their student loans become a <laughs> torpedo with their monthly budget. I also think, too, that these smarter, more educated Generation Zs will be entering into a place where salaries are getting a little bit higher. We all know that there's a fluctuation of salaries right now. And so that they can time their um, entry into the job market where there's this still kind of maybe a little bit inflated or normalized salary range, they're going to have a little bit more buying power. And to couple that again to that first prediction, they are going to be looking for brands that have a social stance, right? Um, one of the new emerging brands that I love is called Coco Kind. Um, it's a, it's a, actually, Robin mentioned beauty. It's a beauty product. Um, but their following is more than just product. It's a belief system. And so I think that these Generation Zs are going to be looking for niche businesses that lean into a belief system um, so that when they choose that brand, it's actually chose, uh, making a demonstration of what is important to them as a person and what they believe in moving forward and what they want to support. So those are my two, and I'm at 236. So I came in just in time. <laughs> well done, Chris. Thoughts, Robin? So I just on your first point and going back that whole purpose driven, I think is really gonna be key because I think the younger generations are speaking. I think they're starting to dictate you know, the products, the type of things they want to know, complete transparency. And, you know, to that point, even I just to mention, I think um, I just discovered, I didn't even know this in Amazon, they're going to start having what they call a climate pledge friendly badge. So you'll be able to identify as a consumer as you're looking for products, ones that are sustainable. So I think you're right on on that. Pledge, Great. you know, purpose driven. Great. Yeah, Chris, Anyone if else? I could just kind of say, you know, I almost feel like uh, we're there's a different generation than at least I know when I started, you know, a lot of people, you know, want to work for a better cause and they probably saw their parents, you know, working 50 to 60 hours a week and they saw them commuting two hours each way where now, you know, you're seeing, you know, at least my kids are seeing me home more often. I think they're seeing there's a there's a better life than the work life balance. I could also see, you know, certain generations wanting to get paid in crypto or paid in NFT. So I think there's, I think there's a, a whole runway that, you know, <laughs> these new generation, these especially millennials, that they're kind of looking to do, and I give them credit for it. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Anyone else before we move on? Great, great, great. Um, Christine Georgiakakis of Reels, you're up. Hello, everyone, and uh, healthy and happy 2022, ready to go. Uh, thank you for having me on. I, um, yeah, I came up with my two predictions. Uh, the first uh, being more of a general uh, prediction, but uh, a very important one, and that is the explosion of e-commerce. And we know the pandemic bought on that uh, rapid uh, acceleration of e-commerce. And my prediction is that 2022 will have another explosive growth for e-commerce. I think uh, in 21, we had like, I think it was said that it was like an 18% increase. Uh, it's a $900 billion business and it's going to continue to grow. And uh, that growth will have direct impact on television advertising uh, and TV will continue to uh, help the awareness and the brand building of these products and businesses. Uh, it's still the mass reach vehicle uh, that provides a full funnel opportunity and unparalleled transparency, right? We're talking, you hear it all the time. We want to be more transparent. And I think uh, that's really going to be the demand in 2022 that uh, business transactions are more transparent. Um, I also will further that with uh, a strong upfront due to the demand 
of TV advertising. I think we're going to be looking at a very strong upfront marketplace once again. Um, it seems like the linear ratings are kind of um, normalizing as well as the universe numbers. So we're expecting another strong upfront with um, TV ad US TV advertising growing once again. I think they're estimating about six to seven percent. So um, I think, you know, between e-commerce and TV, things are looking really good for us for 2022. And um, just to follow up with that, my second prediction is the groundhog will not see its shadow. <laughs> Only kidding. <laughs> um, no, really, my prediction is that the next name for the uh, COVID variant will be Lambda, yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, but uh, in all honesty, my second prediction is that the mergers and acquisitions will continue in the marketplace. Um, mm -hmm. The larger conglomerates definitely have a lot more money. Um, they're going to be in the marketplace. They're going to be looking to acquire. Uh, what's going to be interesting is really the medium-sized networks and, and what's going to happen to those because they either have to go niche or they're going to have to be uh, part of the conglomerates. So um, we're going to keep an eye on that, but there's definitely going to be a lot more of that activity in 2022 for sure. Great. Thanks, Christine. Thoughts from the, from the group? Whoa, someone got a fax? Or was that just on my ear? Um, I, you know, Christine, actually, I'd love to hear your perspective as someone from a small, smaller to medium-sized network that's still independent on, on that M&A activity and, and, you know, where, what, Reels has done a great job of, of keeping itself independent with incredible programming and different options, but what, where do you guys stand in, in this whole, in this whole situation right now? Uh, yeah, I mean, as far as Reels goes, we are uh, definitely looking at building scale. Uh, we have partnered with, um, uh, I'm sure most of you have heard, but we've partnered with Access TV. We are representing them in the ad sales space. So we do know that um, scale is important. We are looking at uh, growing into the OTT and AVOD and SVOD space. We're already there. Um, it's a matter of being uh, equipped to sell the ad space there. So uh, there, we are looking to grow. We know that's you know the future. Uh, we've already put uh, things in place there, uh, and there's a lot more going on with our content. So uh, we'll be able to announce more maybe in a month. But we have exciting things going on, and um, content is the driver. So uh stay tuned for reels we have uh some big announcements coming up great 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 um if, the, if no one else oh mars go ahead mars go ahead oh you're on mute sorry um uh, just seconding what christine said talking about strong upfronts and and e-commerce um as an agency as a as a direct response agency we're sort of remnant slash arbitrage uh buyers and we've seen uh really since the worst of covid we've seen cpms uh start to shoot way up with more and more uh d to c players more hybrid brand response kind of players coming into the space um and then connected tv and everything related uh, which is starting with significantly higher cpms for video will, will also i think be a big driver so um, the upfronts are going to be strong, I think, both in terms of the number of new entries in the space um, and the drive up of CPMs in general, regardless of, uh, you know, regardless of uh, what you call the linear ratings. Um, so I, I, I second that. Okay, great. Thank you, Marseille. Um, moving on, uh, Mike Johnson from Pamerang. You're, you're fresh off of a, a late night flight, I hear. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, it's interesting. I think I'm Debbie Downer today. Maybe it's because I didn't really sleep, but I had uh, 
a really nice meal out in Orange County last night in, uh, you know, some great <laughs> weather. And it's like uh, zero degrees, as you know, Tom, today. It's, uh, it wasn't great getting off the plane coming back to Maine. Um, you know, I, I, um, I found out some information last night, and I wanted to bring that into the, the talk today. Um, I, what I, you know, what I think is really interesting is I heard that TikTok is now one of the biggest search engines out there. Um, and I think, you know, we're finding out that information. I think that, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, there's going to be a lot more advertising having to be done on TikTok, which I don't actually like or love. But I know that my children, uh, I've got three, 14, uh, 18, and 21, and they're on there all the time. I don't love the fact that I don't think that uh, television, as we see it today through cable, is going to be as relevant uh, in, in the future. I, you know, I think, you know, I see them using, uh, you know, YouTube all the time and TikTok and all these other uh, avenues. Uh, Hulu, uh, not so much cable television as much. So I, I think that uh, we're going to be moving over to using those platforms, unfortunately. Um, and, 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 you know, it's my second one, but it's kind of part of it as well, is I think there's going to be a lot less discretionary income over the next couple of years. Um, and definitely in the, uh, you know, the, the middle age market where we're seeing, you know, um, you know, gas prices go through the roof. We're seeing my grocery bill went from about two hundred, two hundred fifty dollars a week up to five hundred dollars, and I think there's going to have there's going to be a lot less discretionary income. Um, I think that um, I don't know how these Generation Zs and Millennials are going to be able to afford homes. Um, you know, I'm looking out there and seeing you know a house next door to me. You know, three years ago would have sold for two hundred fifty thousand uh, because of COVID, because of people moving up from Boston and places like that. They're selling between eight hundred and a million now for a place that a few years ago sold for a quarter of that. So I, I see um, a lot less discretionary income in the future, and I, I'm really concerned how that's going to affect some of these buying patterns. Um, it, uh, it it's going to be interesting. Um, I know that I don't have the extra money that I had um, a few years ago. There's not as many restaurants to go to anymore to spend that money. But um, but it, I think it's um, things are changing very quickly, and I think we all need to pay attention to where we're going to put our resources uh, to advertise and things like that, because I think it's changing so fast that um, we need to pay attention to that and uh, make sure that we're investing in, in, in the right verticals. Thanks, Mike. Uh, thoughts? I, I see a variety of my, oh, sorry about that, Chris. I, I was just gonna say, I see a variety of my clients who are actually uh, you know, buying a lot of ads on TikTok and other online platforms because they are targeting different audiences, but not only the younger audience, but the older audience is starting to get addicted to things like TikTok and platforms as well. So dollars are going in that direction that I'm finding from various PR clients of mine. Yeah, I, I think that the um, I love the insight on the on the TikTok and also that note on discretionary income. I think you're right, and I think that people are going to be picking and choosing where they spend their money. Like you said, restaurants are closing, so you know they that might have been ch challenged. But we know that home improvement and outdoor camping and outdoor recreational businesses surged over the last couple of years. Um, and I think that Mike, you touched on something really insightful. And it goes back to what Robin also talked about with Generation Z, and that these are going to be the, the most savvy consumers that the planet has ever seen. They're going to understand what they want, who they want to buy from, and why they want to buy from them, and what they want to buy. So an avenue like TikTok is fantastic because they're going to be really selective and curate the people that they follow and the people that they want to be influenced by. Um, so that's going to be a really interesting change to see as well that. Um, I think gone are the days of, of mindless purchasing with this generation. They're going to be um, very targeted. And so the advertising, I think, has to be smarter than ever. Mm -hmm. The key word is, is curate, Chris. You, you hit it spot on. It's curate. All right. Thank you, everybody. Let's move forward. And uh, Mike, I think we need to get back to you back to Orange County and maybe like oh, a rooftop deck with a cocktail that. or something. Come on. <laughs> 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 get get out in the sun. I mean, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. I'm going to the sun on Friday. Um, Daniel, 
you're up next. Uh, welcome, and, and uh, we're happy to have you here. Uh, we, we went dark one, one person earlier than we thought we were going to. <laughs> I'm really glad to be here. I very different predictions coming from me, but that is also because be, before I was a Baker Hostetler partner, I spent 23 years at the Federal Trade Commission. So I'm going to do a little bit about the FTC and some of those issues. Uh, the big FTC news this year will be uh, the fifth commissioner, Alvaro Bedoya, will eventually get confirmed, I think, in the spring by the Senate, and there will be a full commission, three Democrats and uh, to Republicans. So it's going to kick off, I think, a series of new initiatives that have been on hold while we've currently had a 2-2 stalemate at the FTC. I think you're going to see a bunch of rulemakings kicked off um, on the competition side and definitely on the privacy side, and it will be framed as surveillance marketing, you know, raising issues about data that's being collected and used for targeted advertising. Um, these, these rulemakings, I should say, last a long time. They span administrations, so there will be a lot of focus on the rulemakings, but just keep in mind, they will go on for a long time and won't, won't come to a conclusion for, for quite a long period of time. Um, they'll also kick off a number of studies on areas that are interested they're interested in, from privacy to issues involving workers and franchises. So FTC, a, a new invigorated agency with a Democratic majority, will kick off a lot. Um, Secondly, on privacy issues more generally, I think Congress will make some progress on privacy issues. The states will still take the lead. Obviously, there's three states that have passed broad privacy legislation. We'll see more doing that. But I do think Congress is going to make some progress, particularly on more privacy issues involving kids and teens. And actually, Robin, related to the issue you raised, I think that issue of authenticity and teens and what they're seeing and, and the body image issues is really increasing the interest in Congress about, you know, how kids' information is being used to target content and advertising to them. So I do think we will see some more, more developments in Congress specifically on, on kids and teens, uh, as opposed to sort of broad privacy writ large covering everything. So um, those are my two. Um, Daniel, thank you, Daniel. Any, uh, any feedback? Or since, you know, we're all here, any questions for Daniel from the group? Uh, uh, since this, here's your chance. <laughs> and I should say, literally every issue that I've heard raised so far, I had sort of regulatory and FTC issues that were popping up. Description <laughs> <laughs> services. I mean, they're all, so I, I have not been chiming in and saying that for everyone, but mm -hmm. pretend I said that for every single uh, item I heard. <laughs> hey, Daniel, I got a question for you. Yeah, you know, Facebook and specifically Mark Zuckerberg came under so much heat, you know, for sharing data that they were not supposed to be sharing. You know, these tech companies do have so, they know so much about us. They know so much about everybody on this call, probably more than they should. I mean, how much more are they going to be? Are they, would you think they would ever possibly look to break up some of these big tech conglomerates? Or, mm -hmm. I mean, is this something like a five year play? Is this two years, right. 10 years? We'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, you know, this is going to continue. There's a huge amount of discussion on, in Congress about this specific issue, about the amount of data that, that, that the, the four or five major tech companies have about all of us. Um, whether they can do anything is, is very unclear. There is um, actually there was news yesterday. The FTC did file a, a lawsuit against Facebook, and one of the remedies they're seeking is to um, peel off WhatsApp and Instagram and break the company up that way. Um, the FTC. Um, again, very preliminary in the case. Originally, the case got dismissed. The judge is now letting the case proceed. So there will be some more law enforcement on that, but it's really unclear if if the current laws that exist in this country really allow for that sort of remedy. Uh, it's a bit of a stretch until Congress does something. Um, unclear what will happen. Great. Anyone else? Daniel, as you hear things come up, feel free to, to jump in. Uh, we'd love to hear, love to hear more from your perspective as always. So thank you. Uh, Fern Lee, you are up next. Thanks for having me as always. Um, so Florida decided to delve into predictions that would affect our business genre and the business of all of us in performance marketing. So our first is, and we're very different than everyone else has talked about, is people power. So as we all know, millions of people unfortunately were furloughed on the, or lost jobs and Others rapidly adjusted to working from home as offices closed during our, the pandemic. So our prediction in 2022 is that more team members will be leaving their jobs and pivoting to new jobs. So negotiations, critical business decisions, brainstorming sessions, 
providing sensitive feedback and traveling are all affecting our businesses in 2022. So our prediction here is the communication and relationship building will be diminished if we don't pivot to build those stronger bridges. So again, you know, really heartfelt onboarding new employees are examples of activities that will lose effectiveness when doing remotely. And our prediction here is that the power of good hires will affect business leadership in 2022. And I think all of our businesses will be touched by this. Um, the redesign of the physical and virtual workplace process is now. And it'll be more reliant on AI and automation. Our prediction, there'll be a reduction in workplace density, which will create a need for team efforts for effective business intelligence and stakeholder, stakeholder collaboration. So one of the big things is we are always looking to see, you know, what some of the big outputs are. So, you know, McKenzie really looked into some of the predictions for 2022, and they felt that the largest people power targets to be negatively affected, like we talked about before, restaurants closing, is food services. What's going to affect our businesses? Customer service and customer sales. So our predictions are that business models will, be, will change for 2022 as with people power. And as a result, remote work and virtual meetings will continue in 2022. We all know there's been a 25, you know, 25 percent increase of people changing jobs since the pandemic started. We really feel that this is going to increase possibly twofold in 2022. So I know, I know it's a little doom and gloom, but I think that we can use this to positivity. Um, so we look at things a lot differently than everyone else. We tend to do it work in an older market workplace. And so one of our big predictions for 2022 is test, test, and testing. And testing is going to be the way in 2022. The consumer is going to need to be touched differently to ensure success as consumer consumption has changed rapidly with COVID. We'll see testing on everything from QR codes to in-depth CTV testing to YouTube apps to brand integrations. And our predictions here are that these platforms are going to be strong in 2022 to test creators before moving to linear TV and will be more robust in the digital funnel. So the title of the demos, we all know the higher the CPMs, but everything is about targeting. You know, proof of concept in the marketplace has been phenomenal kicking off 2022. And some of the things that we need to take note of are is that QR codes improve customer engagement. CTV will be the changing face of targeting. Viewers on YouTube are 50% less likely to skip ads, which is a good thing for us. Um, and brand integrations in linear TV and streaming video influence purchase decisions. So mm -hmm. these are our 2022 predictions from Thor Associates. Great. Thanks, Fern. I think you did a great job of getting two umbrellas, two umbrella prediction topics and wedging in like 12 predictions. So that was awesome. Um, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, actually, Chris, um, I, 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 I know others might have something to say, but I want to turn to you, Chris, because you hosted our Take 20 last week on hiring conundrums. And Fern talked a lot about the staffing and those issues and, and made a pretty bold prediction there about a twofold increase in, in some, some areas. So, yeah, your thoughts. Well, it was, um, we had a, a terrific uh, panel, uh, Ron Hatler from Red Door Interactive. He is a VP of Data and Innovation. It's a digital marketing agency in San Diego. And you say it's in San Diego because that's where the headquarters are. But as we all know, they're all over the, all over the country, if not the world. Um, we also had Jason Putin from Aquin and Vitamin T. He's a higher placement. Um, so he, he manages, you know, clients and he, places talent in those clients and he had one talent that was doing a contract work and then um, that talent was a 60k figure and then that talent got hired um, for 160k um, so it was ri a ridiculous leap in terms of talent and response and pay and responsibility but that's what they were commanding and one of the things that came out of that and from you, you touched on it in terms of the workplace environment especially and the connection between workers um, Ron actually from Red Door said that he's better connected now than they ever were, um, especially executives and middle or younger employees who never would have crossed paths. They never would have walked down the hall to the office or even go upstairs. And especially if you have a multi-level business, one floor will never ever talk to the other floor. It just doesn't happen. But they're trying, but they're trying to make ways in which the executives can talk with folks like they, we are doing now. But Fern, to your point, that's based on the culture, right? If the business doesn't do it, it's not going to happen. 
right? You have to really pay attention to it and really work at it to engage those folks. And Ron's concern was that if everyone is a floating head in the office, um, there's no personal or um, you, know, you don't put your heart into the business because you don't see the people there. Um, so I, I think that um, as you start seeing the, you know, the, the, the job change, uh, change uh, manifest itself, um, I, I think it's going to be less secure and stable and it's going to be more uncertain in the upcoming years. Yeah. Anyone want to add to this? Before we move on. I do believe that um, establishing new relationships are going to be a challenge. I mean, if you have the external relationships, they're only going to be amplified, right? Um, people will be responding to you, but if you don't have those relationships, it's going to be a challenge to establish them and, and have them ongoing. So um, there are some challenges ahead with um, the workplace uh, as it will look like in uh, 2022 for sure. Yeah, Robin, last word real quick. Yeah, just to, to your point about that, I think, you know, to me, the word I hear a lot right now is collaboration because of everybody being virtual. There's just so many different kind of talents. And rather than I think there's a fear of like employee managing employees There's so many things to navigate and what to do and what not to do. And I think there's going to be a shift to collaboration. But to everybody's point, I think. It's a little bit sad for humankind because you know you've got people coming at kids coming out of college uh they're onboarding to new jobs they've never met anybody i mean right. i can't imagine i i think it's but i think it is going to be the new normal fortunately but even training too i think it's going to be a real issue i mean how do you how do you train these people remotely it's it, it's going to be a challenge i, I think so I, can, can I jump in real quick, Tom? I think one of the things mm -hmm. we're seeing in our office is this, is that, that our CEO and our management team really wants everyone to come back in the office. Because what we've seen over the last two years is is that there was lack of collaboration uh, that was there before. That if they have an issue, they typically, the teammate would look at the person sitting next to them and say, hey, you know, this is what's going on. Can you give me an idea how to fix this? And they'd walk around the office and they, they'd join in with each other and, and they'd solve problems a lot quicker when they were in the office and they had more of that personal touch. But on the reverse side, what we're really concerned with is that we want people to come into the office, but these the newer generation does not want to do that. So we're, yeah. you know, if you don't offer that, you are risking losing some decent talent. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a catch-22. You want that collaboration uh, and you want some of these new people, but I do think you lose, you, you do lose out a lot. You know, one of the things that I get really frustrated is I'm a lot of uh, meetings like this and the younger people um, aren't uh, so much sending their children to, to daycare like like we like a lot of us did and I'll see children coming in hopping on laps and kids screaming in the background and you know things like that and and for me I know I'm old you know and you know I just don't think that's as professional as as it should be and you know I understand there's always opportunities where stuff isn't going to be perfect but I'm seeing it more and more often and it is an interruption to the day and I don't know as if people not going into the office um, it, it, it is a good thing. Now, I do think there is a hybrid approach that we should all be looking at, and I think that's where we need to be be moving to, where you know someone comes in two days a week and maybe someone else comes in three, and then they swap back and forth. But mm -hmm. I do think that we we need to we do need that uh, that face to face. There is huge value to it. I've been traveling a lot lately, going to a lot of trade shows. And one of the things that uh, that everybody's saying when, when we do go to these trade shows, like the PDMI network, um, it is um, there's a lot of value to being face to face, and uh, I don't want to lose that um, just because of COVID. Right. I agree with I you, Mike. Understand. I, I think, yeah, you know, I think cool. there's there's going to be an ongoing debate for an, probably years on which which way we're going to go here um, on this, and I think I think it's it's. All all thoughts are worthwhile. So appreciate the feedback, Mike. Marse, you're up uh, with your two predictions. Okay, sorry, I'm muting. Um, <laughs> my first prediction is that this will be the year or the first year of the decade where uh, the C-suites 
particularly chief revenue officers and chief marketing officers are going to wake up to demographic realities and they're going to be much more accountable and have much more respect for for multicultural segments uh, much more discipline in their approach to seg uh, multicultural segments and essentially meaning less tokenism more proactivity um, back uh, last year we we did a talk at the, at the pdmi west and, and and i joked about uh, this is my fifth census uh, already and every decade i wait for america's boardrooms to say you know multicultural is a reality let's deal with it and it's never really we get excited for a couple of years and it never really happens i think that's going to change um and i think it's going to change because there's a new there's a new zeitgeist you know there's a convergence of a lot of social political economic forces you know in the middle of all this divisiveness you know some new truths are kind of revealing and uh, america needs multicultural consumers to grow um, the midterm elections are going to show political influence um, and not not in blocks you know speaking for hispanics or 50 50 democrats and republicans but but how they how they vote and the issues they care about are going to come to the surface um, labor shortages um, which can only be resolved um, you know in the in the short middle and long term with immigration growth controlled immigration growth um, so all of those things, I think, are going to create a zeitgeist where we need to start thinking more about uh, new consumers, new customers, how to reach and grow new customers. Um, you know, and 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 how do we measure this? Well, Hispanic, in, in not only Hispanic but multicultural in general, only represents about seven percent of the marketing spend in the U.S. So it's seven or eight billion dollars out of 150. I mean, there is a huge marketing spend gap. I interpret that from a DR perspective as there's a huge acquisition spend gap or a huge activation spend gap. Um, just to put some hard numbers on that, um, the, if, you, if you divide the total marketing spend by, by adults in the United States, it's about $729 a person that you know, overall corporate America spending. Um, but when you break that down to multicultural, it's $65. So America's spending 10 times more on multicultural consumers than they are um, uh, in the general market. And this is going to impact a lot of things as they decide that we need to start treating multicultural segments more equally. Um, and in particular, the Hispanic, which is the market that, that I play in, it's going to impact. I think that we're going to see a lot more uh, growth in, in, in language, in culture channels. Um, Univision last year launched two new, uh, I think it was last year, right, Prende and uh, the, the Deportes. Um, we're going to see the expansion earlier of a lot more test markets in multicultural, to your point, Fern, test, test, test. You know, the mantra to now is let's wait to see if it works in general and then we'll test multicultural. I think that's going to change. We're going to start testing segments uh, really from day one. There's going to be more diversity in sales and marketing departments, which is what's going to help drive all of this um, and you know I don't want to insult anybody but in general that there's going to be fewer con content microaggressions and I, you know I go back to the respect issue there's going to be less faux pas because there's going to be people more sensible to to multicultural needs so that's the first prediction um, the, related to that because none of that matters if you don't spend more money um, and if you don't spend more money uh, it's likely because you don't have any way of attributing results to multicultural so I think that's the second big prediction, is there's gonna be a lot of new modeling um, in how to differentiate in language, in culture spend from general market spend. Um, and that's a, a layer of a, of a matrix on top of linear versus digital. That's the traditional attribution challenge, uh, but it really needs to be a two-pronged. Um, and we're gonna start seeing companies spend a lot more time and energy figuring out, this is my baseline general. When I lay in multicultural, what happens to my bottom line and and learning that it's not a zero sum, a zero sum game which is how it's kind of been uh treated up until now so those are my Great. two predictions thanks marce anyone want to jump in there anyone i, I think you're spot on and I, and I think that the um the demographics of the country don't lie Right. When they look at the, you know, just for the, the voting ages and the voting types and the, and the way the complexion of the country is moving, we are becoming a more multicultural country. 
Um, my daughters, just personally, my daughters attended a, a school in San Diego called the San Diego Creative and Performing Arts. So it's a public high school, but for performing arts, there's not a single ethnic majority at that school. And that's what they're used to. That's normal to them, right? So anything outside of that starts becoming weird and unnormal. Um, and I think that's a, a, a general direction that we're moving towards. So I think you're ahead of the curve. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, we got to move on. I can say one thing to your point about Gen Z earlier. People don't realize this, but uh, one out of four Gen Zers is Hispanic. Almost one out of three is is multicultural. It, it, so, it is the most multicultural generation um, the world's ever seen. Yeah. In America, especially. Thank you, guys. We got we got to move forward here. Uh, appreciate the the thoughts, Marseille. Really great stuff. Um, Andrea, you're up. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I bring a different perspective from a press, public relations, non-advertising standpoint in the performance-driven space, but certainly the prediction for this year, our brands and service-based companies in the industry are going to truly embrace uh, e-commerce platforms for getting a message across press-wise, meaning podcasts, video casts, TikToks, and YouTubes. Uh, last year, 78% of adults were aware of and listened to podcasts. And by being involved in podcasts, you're getting long form access to talking about your brand, your product, and your service. And I think the fact that we see so many homegrown journalists having legitimate audience following podcasts that you can listen to and engage with on a, a smartphone, a tablet, a computer, when you're on the go, you're seeing a growth to that. And you're seeing that opportunity to buy time on these podcasts to reach hyper-targeted audiences. So we're seeing a growth in that. We're seeing that opportunity to grow <laughs> for brands and others in podcasts where it's true press coverage. I'm not paying for my clients to be featured on podcasts. You might be able to advertise and pay for advertising on podcasts, but we're seeing this growth in TikTok influencers who want to cover products or services. We're seeing this growth on YouTube because any press coverage we get needs to be on YouTube as well. So we're seeing that these platforms, these online platforms, are becoming the content is key, content is king, content is queen method for all of these brands and services that can be reused on websites and on social media platforms and are evergreen. And I think that the prediction of understanding evergreen and understanding how to use these newer journalistic platforms is going to create that bump because as many of you have said before, e-commerce and that click through is what is valid. So it holds true in press as well. So by having something that's online, you have that click through that someone can buy that item, learn about the service, et cetera. So that's prediction number one. Prediction number two is one that I hate to say. Prediction number two in the world of PR has become pay to play. Whereas you're not going to see that on Good Morning America as a whole, you're going to see most TV stations having segments that brands have to pay to get into that product being discussed down the table. So the major networks are not embracing it just yet, but the local stations, in order to pay that lifestyle expert, that lifestyle expert is asking you for money. You can book an interview. You see these half hour infomercials where for 30,000, you can be featured. So this whole method, of pay to play in public relations has skyrocketed since the start of pandemic and continues to grow on so many different levels. And unfortunately, it's really changed the public relations world, but gone are the days that you can get a blip of a mention in USA Today and it would move the needle in the PR world. Now you wanna get a longer lead, a bigger quantity of press coverage that is going to reach target audiences that aren't necessarily taking their time to watch a network broadcast or to read a major market newspaper. So the press world has changed, but I think that brands are starting to embrace 
the understanding of video casts, podcasts, TikTok, YouTube from a press standpoint and then supporting it with that direct response to advertising. So in a nutshell, those are two of my predictions for 2022. Thanks, Andrea. Thoughts from the from the group. So I agree with you, Andrea. We do we've been doing brand integrations for years and years, and they've only gotten more robust. And I I really believe that more brands will start jumping in. And the the key is to know synergistically how to market this correctly and how to wrap this around so it doesn't look like pay for play. And how do you make it look more educational? I think that's going to be the key win for these brands. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think that's one of the things that working with these brands and making sure they're not selling when they're on those kind of platforms and they're talking and they're educating. And it's it's a process and you have to learn it and do it a few times and fail to understand when you get away from the sales and start becoming more editorial. And, and trying to get the measurable results, I would think, too. You know, you, you, you want to find out, you know, what effect did that have? How are my results being, uh, how are they being measured? And that's one of the things that I, I struggle with is that, you know, we need to be in all these different verticals. But, you know, which one is actually bringing me the results and, what, you know, which one is just brand awareness and which one sales? And, and I think that's kind of uh, really important. Yeah, and I think one of the things that's challenging is because of these podcasts, video casts are evergreen. It doesn't mean that it's it's running today. You're going to listen today. You might listen next month or in two months or in six months. So that's where it's harder to uh, quantify. But it's important to be in it for brand growth. Okay, uh, thank you, Andrew. Before we move on, I got to say, uh, I did a I did a podcast hit 18 months ago, and I got an email about it on Monday morning. Ah. Uh, to, to your point, to your point, someone was like, "Hey, I heard you on this podcast. I want to talk to you." I'm like, oh. "So yeah, I mean that that is a very very true statement." <laughs> um, Kyle, you're up. Oh, thanks, guys. Um, uh, my two bold predictions, I wouldn't say they're bold by any stretch. Um, I think they're just more of what I kind of see happening within our marketplace and, you know, within the economy, et cetera. I st and I still think DTC brands are still at the forefront. I mean, we're all consumers and, you know, we like being associated with many of our DTC brands. And you're still seeing many DTC brands activate within our ER performance marketing marketplace um i just the thing i will predict is i think the way that they're measuring success is going to be different i think you know you had some ratings erosion a little bit i think advertisers are switching that the way they quantify success and i think they're going to start utilizing more third-party attribution companies to kind of help do so i think you can throw out the cpm cpp you know, and I think it's going to be driven by specifically performance and the performance that's going to help drive these companies to more successes. Uh, I think one prediction is I want to uh, my last prediction, I guess you could say, is I think streaming is going to continue to grow. Everybody thought that in 2020 streaming took off. And that's, you know, between Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus, is that it was mostly because of the COVID-19 pandemic. when actually in 2021 streaming actually grew even further and i still think what drives it is content it's like almost that escapism you know people love watching yellowstone people love watching emily in paris succession ozark you know this is it's you know you can kind of leave yourself for an hour and go to a different world and like it's also very good storytelling and i think that's going to continue to drive for a lot of these svod and even avod services um, I still think Netflix is still the king. I think that, you know, they're still number one. They have 214 million subscribers, but uh, I know that Disney Plus is kind of catching up to them, even though they have kind of leveled off a little bit. Uh, I still think AVOD services is, AVOD is going to be the biggest growth in 2022 uh, and beyond. Uh, I think people, more and more people are, you know, they don't mind seeing the ad service to them. It's also a bit cheaper. Uh, and I just, you know, I see, you know, more and more companies like what Christine said, merging, you know, uh, and nobody really saw the Discovery Warner uh, merger happening. But I think it's going to it's going to be continued growing theme. I think the bigger platform you can make for a consumer and be charging a monthly premium and having that constant monthly cash flow will be I think that's going to be paramount. So that's those are my two 
those are my two predictions or what I see for this coming year. Thanks, Kyle. Anyone with thoughts on those? What I well, like there's is no doubt I um, feel like in the streaming uh, space that retention is going to be an issue moving forward. And I think um, it's all about content, as you said, Kyle. I mean, uh, that's going to be key. And um, the bigger guys have the deeper pockets and um, they'll likely win out. It'll be interesting what happens to the middle guys and the smaller guys and how they'll play out. But um, yeah, uh, it's going to be a content play and it'll be interesting. Chris, you were jumping in. Uh, very quick, because I know we're running out of time, but I'd like to tie into what Robin said at the beginning of the broadcast with uh, uh, recurring revenue and subscriptions, that the, the subscription of a product or the subscription of content, um, folks don't care. They're going to pay monthly for something that they enjoy. Yeah, yeah, and I think to the point that, that uh, Christine just touched upon as well, I mean, it's about content. We've talked about this before on, on Brand Response Council. People are jumping from from one to the from one service to the next based on what they want to watch um and stats are showing this you know stats are showing this and really just quick comment to that about subscription and everything you talked about streaming i'm a big fan of scott galloway and he just talked about something that unfortunately all of this sort of membership it's kind of exploiting our inability as humans to manage our time and to value time which is why there's like the true app bill the true app True Bill app, you know, that's like 85 million in, in funding. Yeah. Remember to cancel your subscription. <laughs> so I think it all plays into that. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Well, Mike, we got to jump forward. Yeah, we got yeah, one that. more person still to go. So, um, uh, Andrea, thanks for, for joining us. I know you got to jump off, so thank you. Uh, Patrick? Uh, let's let's hear from you. Don't, no, don't uh, don't limit yourself based on the fact that it's going to be the top of the hour. Please share your thoughts. <laughs> No worries. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, honestly, the benefit of going last is, well, you probably heard most of it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, definitely as the content creator, my my fearless prediction, uh, basically Robin and Andrea already covered it ad nauseum here, but it is, you know, content is definitely king uh, this year. Uh, and with that authentic content, uh, whether it's podcasts, uh, whether we're you know, seeding our content into Facebook, doing TikToks, uh, that it is more and more going that direction than anything else uh, as, as a content creator. Um, secondly, uh, the nimbleness of the content creation that has happened over the last couple of years will even go further. Uh, and with that, I mean, um, a few years ago, to give you an idea, you know, in the DR world, we certainly would capture content for a long form or a short form. And we would figure out, oh, okay, well, we're gonna capture some of this content over here and we're gonna do some, maybe we'll put this on Facebook or we'll do this here. Uh, and then a few years ago, Fern and I worked on a project together and for a, a, mu a mutual client uh, that she brought me in on. Um, and they had a great YouTube strategy and, and a great TV strategy. I'm sure they have gone much further with that now. Um, but, you know, now how we capture content and how uh, we are um, strategizing everything we do, it has become so specific and so on purpose. So when we're shooting, it's it's become much easier in some ways because we shoot, uh, we go in with a strategy of a list of things and we shoot for TikTok, we shoot for Facebook, we're shooting for TV, we're shooting for everything but it's not the same thing. So we're shooting different things at different times, but in the same environment, because everything's gotten cheaper, we need to spend less money, but at the same time, you wanna set up an environment and capture content that is organic and you know, in, in, a, in a way that people will connect with. Uh, and I think that's just going to become more and more part of everything that we do in our industry. Great. Thanks, Patrick. Thoughts? 
I think it needs yeah. to be relevant, and I, I think that's what Patrick was saying, is that, you know, you need to make this content relevant. It's interesting watching my kids, what they watch. It's something I, I, I think is stupid, but, you know, but then you find out that, it, it that you know, they're getting millions and millions of hits on this, and, and part of that also is keeping the, 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 the price down low. I mean, someone mentioned that with us 214 million uh, users with, with Netflix, I mean, if you charge that at ten dollars, I mean that that that's two point one billion dollars a month they're making. You know, so you know, keeping that content relevant and keeping that price real low, um, you know, it, it is really interesting because you don't drop it. It's like having that Planet Fitness membership. You might only go three times a year, but because it's so low, you keep you keep investing in it, and as long as they can. Just give a little bit of content out there that keeps you interested once in a while, reproducing those Ozarks and things like that. You know, um, I, I think that, you know, that's where everything is going to go in the future. Um, I yeah. think, you know, there's going to be more TikToks out there. Yeah, I think so, too. I think, Patrick, we talked about briefly in the lead up to this about how it's almost become self-limiting in a way in, the, in, the, in, the, in your in your own create, creativity because you have to shoot for this space, right? It's, it's yep. not It's not... You're, but when you're shooting a TikTok, it's yeah. very different than shooting content for Facebook. Very different. Yep. So there's a whole different method and thought process behind it. Like you have to be thinking like what, you know, you're targeting that audience, right? And and mm -hmm. there are different audiences within TikTok now. So you have to think about, you know, what you're doing with, with what. So Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, before we close out, anybody anybody else on Patrick's thoughts? All right. Well, great. Um you know, we've run over by a couple minutes, but uh, I think we did a, a great job. Really tremendous thoughts, everybody. We really appreciate everyone's time, uh, both our both our speakers and, and those who have joined us to watch today. Obviously, this video will be up on our website here, uh, most likely by Friday. Uh, so uh, we're, we're looking forward to, to getting it out to the folks who, who weren't here and letting them hear, hear these great voices. Um, thanks again to our speakers and to the Workshop Council for the event. If you'd like to get involved in one of our councils, you can reach out to me and, and share your interest directly in any of the uh, five councils that we operate. These folks are, are, are working on all of them, like we said before, uh, tremendous groups who are bringing great wisdom to, to everybody involved with the PDMI. Your next opportunity to attend a PDMI event live online is the next edition of Take 20, our bi-monthly 20-minute webinar series created by the Brand Response Council. That event is next Wednesday, January 19th at 2 o'clock Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. For more information and to register, please visit the pdmi.com slash take-20. The announcement of our next one-hour winter seminar series event, set for late February and created by the PDMI's e-commerce council, is coming soon. Keep an eye on our website, social media, and your inbox for more information and your chance to register. Thank you again for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your work week. Be well. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.